Okay, good afternoon on this Sunday. Welcome to everyone. Um, we have this sort of special techie kind of meeting today. <laughs> I'm not very much of a techno person myself, but I'll do my best. Um, I meant to introduce the meeting by giving some information about the background of the Lupa Society. Uh, the Lupa Society was founded in March 1988. Um, our first members, our founding members, included people like Kent Cumberbatch, who worked in the immunology lab in the hospital, Zenora Ascarali, who also worked there, some of you are familiar with, Curtis Wilson, who became our first president and sadly is now deceased. Uh, Pamela Williams, we had people like Rosita Edwards, who now lives in Venezuela, I think. Dr. Kim Mirage, everybody's familiar with. Dr. Leslie Roberts, Dr. David Commoner, who became our first patron. And lots of other people were important in the startup of this society. Many of them, I'm sad to say, um, have passed. But as you know, the society has gone from strength to strength. Uh, Clifford Balgobin is our current president and only our second president. But we hope that this society has a lot more life to live and a lot more to give lupus patients. I'm not going to go on any longer because we have a special guest today who's going to give us a lot of information about lupus. Thank you, Clifford. Thank you very much, Dr. Sweet, or patron doctor. Uh, this is our first ever live lupus seminar, and it's free, of course, free. Uh, we have a lot of people coming on to look. Are we asking that you please share the link? Please share it on Facebook. Please share it on all your social media platforms because the information you're about to hear today will help you, help your family, help your friends to understand lupus and to understand how to deal with people who has people who have lupus. We have our special guest today. He is a national rheumatologist. And I just heard before we came live that Dr. Sweet taught him in school. <laughs> We won't give away how long that was, but they had a good thing going there with their communication. So without further ado, I'd like to invite our rheumatologist, national rheumatologist, who goes all over the, the hospitals in Trinidad. Uh, he told me that he has been around for 20 years in this field. And um, he's very passionate about what he, do, he does. He's also a good friend of the Lupus Society of Trinidad and Tobago and an advocate of lupus. So let us welcome uh, our dear Dr. Dynan. Dr. Dynan. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Balgobin, Dr. Sweet, and uh, all our viewers. Uh, first of all, let me say a gratitude of thanks to Mr. Balgobin for having me again to talk on a lupus society of Toronto Tobago forum. I really do enjoy being able to impart some of the knowledge about lupus because I believe it is so important. So I would like to thank him again for having me. And I would like to say publicly thanks to Dr. Sweet who has taught me uh, for uh, quite a while and uh, a lot of the knowledge I have about dermatology and um, some of the things which I used uh, since um, has been passed down from Dr. Sweet. So thank you, Dr. Sweet. So today, the format of the talk will actually take uh, what we call the common questions. So what I thought I would do is I looked back at what are some of the common questions that people would ask in the office, uh, sometimes out of office in the hospital. And uh, I thought that I would try to address these questions in an orderly fashion so that uh, I would be able to go through um, the whole uh, process of lupus, uh, what is, how we diagnose, um, 
uh, what treatments are given for um, the condition. And then there's, uh, towards the end, there are two very important things that I always get asked, and that is about lupus and pregnancy and children um, and lupus. So first of all, let's start with the question, uh, what is uh, lupus? So lupus is what we call an autoimmune disorder. And what exactly we mean by an autoimmune disorder, to put it very simply, an autoimmune disorder is a condition in which your, your body is acting against itself. And that is simply enough for us to understand but what I would like to say most emphatically, because it's a question I get asked on many occasions, is that lupus is not a form of cancer. I don't know where this uh, concern arose, but I've been asked that question on many occasions, but uh, I wanted to use the opportunity to just highlight that. Uh, now, most people ask, what is the cause of lupus? Um, as they would do with any condition for which they are being treated. Now, it is not straightforward, even up until this day with all of the research that is available. However, what is well known is that there are many factors which might come to play uh, with regards to this condition. Firstly, it is believed that uh, uh, the person who is afflicted with the disorder has to have some sort of genetic predisposition to the condition itself. And once that sort of background is laid, there is usually what we call triggering factors. And the triggering factors could actually be one of a few things. Um, it is well known that sunlight, for example, is a trigger triggering factor in the cause of the disease. Stress is another triggering factor, and there are other things. So stress in particular could be very, very um, important. I, I have had scenarios where I have seen patients who have been experiencing or going through a stressful period of their life, and they have presented with symptoms and signs and subsequently diagnosed as lupus without having any sort of medical problems previously. So stress is something that we must bear in mind. Dr. Dynan, Dr. Sure. Dynan, uh, yes. do you have a, do you have an actual presentation? Because we need we need to see it on the screen. Right. So, so you, can share, you can share your screen presentation. We'll share it for the for the viewers to see. Right. So the the presentation is actually being shared already. So I'm not quite sure how it didn't come up as yet, but it is being shared. Okay. Now while you're talking, will mm -hmm. you take uh, questions at the same time? I have no problem with that. If there is something that someone wants to ask, um, I will pause and try my best to, um, to explain because I think it would allow for the for everyone to um, to follow what is being said. So I have no problem with that. Okay, so if you to interact with the yeah. doctor live on the studio, I'm gonna share the link on, on YouTube. You click on it and we will put you into the studio. Right. So the only thing, Mr. Balgobin, I don't know how the shared presentation hasn't come up as yet. So I don't know if you're seeing it as yet. Unfortunately, not yet. Okay. So we will, whilst I'm talking, we will probably try that um, to, to see if we could reload it and, and get it going. Sure. Um, right. So that, those are the key points with, with regards to the things that um, cause lupus, as I was saying. Now, once we have someone who is genetically predisposed, as I mentioned. And once we have some sort of triggering factor that um, sets off the, um, the disease process, then what happens is there is a production of what we call antibodies in, in the patient's uh, uh, body. And these antibodies then target certain um, organs, um, which to be honest, which you could be almost any organ, but there are some that are the favorite. And uh, once these organs are targeted, a, an inflammatory process is set up. And it is the inflammatory process that leads to many of the um, symptoms that patients would actually pre um, present with. 
Okay, so the, the presentation is there sharing. So you, Mr. Balgobin could probably have a look and see if he could get that on for you all. Right, so the next question that I get that is commonly asked is what are the symptoms of lupus? Now, it is worthwhile to understand, first of all, that lupus can affect almost any organ system in the, in, in the body. But there are a few organ systems that actually are what we say um, more commonly affected. And the two most commonly affected organs would be one, the skin, and there are myriad of uh, different uh, skin manifestations that someone could actually have the most common being in the form of what is well known as the butterfly rash. And the other more, most common um, presentation that uh, we see is actually with joint involvement. So it is not uncommon for patients to actually present with symptoms or signs of inflammation of the joints, which actually causes joint pain, joint swelling, and joint stiffness. Now, if there are no other uh, manifestations of the disease, this form of presentation can actually easily be misinterpreted as being due to some other cause, say, for example, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, when in truth and in fact, it is actually the onset and presentation of, um, of lupus. Now, kidney involvement is something that we also see quite often. And many times we actually have patients who would be admitted to hospital for urgent care because they have significant kidney involvement. And from my um, uh, uh, own experience, uh, there are a couple of times that patients have actually presented to the hospital and been diagnosed eventually with lupus simply on um, due to involvement of the kidney and without any skin or without any joint um, a manifestation. So that is something important that we know we should bear in mind. Dr. Then, Dinan, sorry yes. to interject, but I got a question here posted mm -hmm. on um, on YouTube. Yeah. The question is, why is it advised not to become pregnant if you have lupus? So towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to deal with pregnancy. So I can answer that question here. But um, it, it will probably flow better with the presentation if we leave that one to the end. I don't know if that'll be all right. Because, because I have a few words to say about pregnancy and lupus. Okay, no problem. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so the other organ systems which could actually be uh, involved would be things like the heart. So some patients actually present with uh, chest pain due to inflammation around the heart. Sometimes you could get fluid collection around the heart. Uh, some people have inflammation along the lining of the lung, which could again cause chest pain. And then there are other things like uh, involvement of the brain or involvement of the, of the nerves. Just to give an idea of the, the um, various um, presentations that you could have. So what is important is, once we have these symptoms, we want to move to the stage of uh, how do we go about diagnosing this condition? Now, a lot of, a lot of people, <clears throat> when they have symptoms, it's a, it's a very common practice in Trinidad, and I'm sure Dr. Sweet will be smiling when I see this, uh, that uh, people usually consult everybody else except their own doctor on the first instance. So they will talk to the neighbor, they will talk to the neighbor friend, they will go and visit other people and get their opinion. And when all else fail, then they would actually say, okay, they are going to, to visit the doctor. So that doesn't happen in all the cases, but in a significant amount. But in order for lupus to be diagnosed, the first thing that has to happen is someone has to have a, a consultation with their doctor. And the doctor will take a very detailed history and perform an examination. Now, I am very big on history taking and examination because I think that there is a lot um, that is to be said about the presenting complaint that the patient might have. And sometimes you can actually make the diagnosis or be fairly certain of the diagnosis of lupus just by the clinical presentation without any investigation or anything of the sort. Now, once we've done the first bit, 
we move on to doing um, investigations. Now, investigations could come in many forms. So I will split them up into different groups. We would look at blood investigations first. Now we always do routine blood investigations, like say, for example, blood count, kidney function, liver function, sometimes just to have what we call baseline values, but sometimes it's very useful because the condition could affect either the blood uh, or it could affect the uh, liver causing inflammation in the liver, or as I mentioned earlier, you could have problems with the kidney. So the problem with um, the routine blood test could actually be very revealing. Now, once we've done that, the next thing we do is actually what we call markers of disease activity. So these are the so-called inflammatory markers. Some patients will be familiar with it as in the form of a ESR. We also do something called complements. What these do is they actually allow us to gauge the um, severity of the disease to some extent, and they actually could also be used to monitor the disease. And then the third set of blood tests that we do would be what we call immunology tests. So the immunology tests, uh, what people will actually call the lupus test, we see. And uh, the important thing to note with these is whilst there is a significant number of uh, investigations that we could do that will actually be very suggestive of the diagnosis, it is as I said, important to bear in mind that usually the diagnosis is made with a combination of evidence, the immunology test, the other blood test, the history, the examination findings. Then sometimes if we will do a, a urine test and if the urine actually has blood or perhaps uh, protein in it, then we might want to go on and do something called a 24 hour urine collection where we could quantify the amount of protein that is being lost in the urine. Or we could do what we call a spot sample of the urine where we could just take a one off sample, send it to the lab and do a fancy test that could tell us how much protein is being lost. Now, in addition to these investigations, there are uh, biopsies which we could do. Sometimes we actually biopsy the skin or we biopsy the kidney. So what a biopsy is, is really taking a sample of tissue. So sometimes um, a sample of the skin will be taken by the dermatologist and sent to the lab for analysis to assist with the diagnosis. And sometimes the, um, the, we could actually biopsy the, the kidneys, which we do quite often. And we get an idea of, first of all, whether the kidney is involved or not, and then as to the extent of the um, involvement. Now, we also have special tests, like say, for example, we think along the lines of somebody might have, let us say, involvement of the, the lungs. We might want to do chest X-ray. We might want to do lung function tests. We might want to do CT scan. If we think the heart is being involved, we might want to do ECG, echocardiogram. If we think the brain is being involved, we might want to do an MRI of the brain. We might want to do what we call an EEG, which is a brainwave tracing of the brain. So the uh, other tests are usually very much guided by what we are suspecting and what we want to look at. So once we've done the various investigations and we have a history that we have taken very carefully, we more or less say that, okay, we are comfortable or confident that we are working with a diagnosis of lupus. Now, once we get to that stage, what we have to decide next is how we're going to treat the condition. Now, treatment comes in many forms. There are medications that we will use for treatment. There are some special advice that we will give. There is lifestyle advice that we will give. But if we look at um, uh, the, the, um, the specific advice before we go into medication, we will see that, and patients will be familiar with this, that we usually tell them to avoid sunlight. Now, if you recall what I had said at the beginning with in terms of aggravating um, factors, you would have noted that I mentioned that sunlight was one of the aggravating factors that could actually lead to the onset of the disease. And so too, it could actually lead to flare ups. So we usually uh, advise patients to avoid sunlight uh, as uh, um, or if they're going out to make sure they cover up properly, use um, proper um, sunblock and that sort of thing, wear broad rim hats, etc. The other thing we do with specific advice is that it's important to actually manage stress because stress is another thing mentioned earlier again that could actually cause lupus or it could cause a patient with known lupus to actually have a flare. Now, with regards to medication, there is a good old saying that medications only work if you take them. And I have a significant um, number of patients that we see 
on a regular basis, I'm sad to say, who are not very compliant with medication. They always miss medication. Sometimes they feel um, well, so they think they don't need to take medication. Sometimes they have side effects. They, they don't want to take the medication. But it's important to be compliant with medication. And if you are having problems with any particular medication, then it is important that you bring that to the doctor who's managing you so that it could be addressed. And uh, maybe there is something different that could be used um, that would not be associated with any um, uh, side effect. And the last thing is, of course, on the, the, on the note of uh, specific advice is that you really need to be compliant with your scheduled visits because the visits are used to assess the, the condition, the visits are used to assess the medication, side effects with medication, your tolerance, whether the medications are working, a whole host of things goes on in the, um, the visit. So it's important that patients are compliant. Now, Everybody always asks about lifestyle changes. So the first thing I would like to say is that uh, what I'm about to tell you all about um, lifestyle changes, which we will probably go into a little bit more detail um, later on, is that lifestyle changes do not um, have uh, the, the, the data for, re, uh, for research and some of the lifestyle changes is variable. So when we talk about lifestyle changes, it's important to take that with what we say in Trinidad with a pinch of salt, try it, see if it works for you, just make sure you're not doing any harm to yourself in the process. So let's look at medications in a little bit more detail. Now, what we do first of all is if someone comes to you with a complaint, let us say it's a skin rash, let us say it is joint pain, then what the patient is really after is the after treatment for their symptoms. And it is important that at the very onset of the disease, even whilst we still are waiting investigations for the confirmation of a, a diagnosis, that we must proceed with some form of treatment. And this treatment could take many forms. Uh, if it is just a simple skin rash, sometimes uh, the dermatology doctors would probably say just use a topical medication and that might be sufficient. Sometimes it isn't, you might have to use um, steroid tablets. Um, similarly, if you present with joint pains, you may not be able to use simple painkillers like a Panadol, Paracetamol. You might have to use a, a course of steroids. So you do whatever you have to do to treat the symptoms. Um, and sometimes you have to carry on with symptomatic treatment until your longer term treatment actually becomes effective. Now, when we look at longer term treatment, there's a few things that we need to, to, to mention. The first of it is actually the use of this drug uh, called hydroxychloroquine. Now, with this re uh, uh, onset of um, uh, COVID that is that we are experiencing at present, I don't think anybody will not be familiar with the word hydroxychloroquine. Now, hydroxychloroquine is one of the most important drugs that has to be used for lupus patients. It is used to treat the muscle and joint symptoms. It is used to treat the skin symptoms. And it is actually used for its protective and long-term beneficial effect. So it has protective effects against, say, for example, flares in kidney disease, um, occurrence and flares of uh, diseases affecting the, um, the brain and so on. So when patients are placed on hydroxychloroquine, unless there is a problem um, which causes you to have to stop the drug, you should actually be taking your hydroxychloroquine as prescribed and on a regular basis. Then we move to the group of drug called the steroid sparing um, agents. Now, the steroid sparing agents actually come in the form of a few drugs which we will be familiar with. So one of them is a drug called azetaparin, which is a mild drug, but it allows for um, the, the tapering and eventual discontinuation of uh, steroids, um, which, are, which is why they are called steroid sparing agents. Sometimes you need uh, immunosuppressive drugs like uh, mycophenic mycophenolate morphotil, better known as Celsep, or sometimes myphotic. These drugs not only allow you not, uh, to come off and not be on steroids, but these drugs are what are quite often referred to as induction agents. And what I mean by that is that uh, if, for example, say someone has kidney involvement with lupus, 
and you really need to get on top of it, then you must give, in addition to the steroid treatment, you must introduce a more aggressive agent that will actually help shut the disease down and allow you to be able to slowly taper off the steroids. Another drug that we use quite commonly is cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide could be given by tablets, but is more commonly used, especially in my setting, in the uh, intravenous form, where we give what we call pulses of cyclophosphamide, where you, you attend for cyclophosphamide at set intervals, and then um, we, um, we t finish the course and then move on to what we call a maintenance agent, which could either be the acetaparin or the cell cell. Now, is Dr. Dynan, uh, sure. Dr. Dynan, someone just asked, yes. someone just asked this question here. Let me let's share it on your screen. Yes, I saw the question on the um, the screen. Is cyclophosphamide, excuse the spelling, infusion, treatment, kidney problems in patients with lupus? And the answer to that question is yes. That cyclophosphamide is actually one of the very well known drugs that um, we use even before the onset of. Um, or, or the introduction of uh, microphenolate morphetil, even before that time, cyclophosphamide was being used. And as a matter of fact, when we use a lot of the newer agents, what we are actually, when they do research with the newer agents, they actually compare the newer agents to, um, to, to cyclophosphamide because cyclophosphamide has a proven track record. So the other thing is that... Um, with the cyclophosphamide, obviously, um, we have to be very careful in terms of the um, risk of um, uh, side effects that we um, could possibly face with it, just like with, um, with other um, um, medication. Right, so cyclophosphamide. Then there is a few other um, drugs that we, um, we, we use. Um, and uh, give me two seconds, Mr. Balgobin. Sorry about that. Um, I'll, I'll just took a minute to uh, update um, Dr. Wong um, with what we were doing. So Dr. Wong is the guy I was telling you all about earlier on who would be assisting us. In. All right, so back to the presentation. So some of the, the other drugs that uh, we um, have in the marketplace uh, are well, really two mainly. One of them is actually a drug called um, Ben Lister which is licensed for use, but is actually not available um, locally for us here. And sometimes we could use a drug called rituximab. Um, so although it is not licensed officially for use, but it has been used to treat the condition um, before. So I will pause for a, a second here just to find out if there is any question with regards to the medications, because I've said quite a bit about the medication. So is there anything that anyone has asked Mr. Balgobin that needs clarification with the medication or we can leave it till the end? We we can continue. No one asks about the question uh, about the medication except that one we just heard, but I'm, I myself can't pronounce. Right, that's okay. Cyclophosphamide. At the beginning, I couldn't pronounce it either. <laughs> okay, right. So we will move along with the presentation. So let's look a little bit about the lifestyle changes. So let's talk a little bit about diet. Now, Patients always ask me about what diet they should use specifically for, for lupus. Now, I just want to, to let people know up front that as far as I'm aware, unless somebody knows something different, that there is no lupus-specific um, diet. So there are things that people advise. So like, say, for example, they advise you to try to avoid... Um, uh, for, for example, pro-inflammatory foods. Um, some of the pro-inflammatory foods will be things like uh, refined sugars, um, red meat, processed foods, those sorts of things. Um, they will, and they would tell you that you could probably use supplements in the form of things like omega-3, things like turmeric. So those are the things that I was referring to when I said that the research data that surrounds these things are probably limited. But they are general advice that we give um, people um and is worthwhile trying but the one thing i would actually say is that whatever um diet or whatever you decide to do is please try to avoid 
severe dietary restrictions to such an extent that you actually put yourself at risk for malnutrition. And it could happen not only with conditions like lupus, like say, for example, with other autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, say, um, some people actually um, try to avoid so many things that you run the risk of actually not using enough, um, uh, obtaining enough nutrients from your diet. Okay, so the next thing we would look about that I like in particular is to talk about rest. Now, I don't think people think about this and focus about it too much, but I think that uh, adequate rest is important and rest comes in many forms, one of which is actually sleep. And when I counsel patients, I usually tell people that they need a fair amount of sleep. Now, one of the best ways to sleep is actually to have fixed sleeping times so that you actually go to bed at a certain time and you wake up at a certain time and you get a proper um, night's rest. Um, the other form of rest is actually, and, and people may not necessarily think about it, but if you think about activities that you do on a daily basis for people who go to work, it's important that you actually pace yourself when um, you are doing your activities and don't try to get everything done in one day. Do what you have to do, take a break, rest, recuperate, then do what you have to do again, try not to overstress yourself. Right, so the next thing we will talk about a little bit is about exercise. Now, regular cardiovascular exercise is actually good for almost any medical condition. If you suffer from diabetes, if you suffer from high blood pressure, if you suffer from high cholesterol, if you suffer from a lot of other medical problems, including some other autoimmune problems like rheumatoid arthritis, cardiovascular exercise is of great benefit and cardiovascular vascular fitness is important. Now, when I say cardiovascular ex exercise, I am not necessarily trying to tell patients that they need to go and join a gym and they need to work out on a treadmill. You don't necessarily need to do that. What you do need to, to, what you could do that is adequate as far as I'm concerned is actually if you could get into a nice routine of doing brisk walking. Now, I will stress on the word brisk walking because a lot of people go for walks and they take walk in, walks in the park with friends. Now, that is good because something is better than nothing, but just bear in mind that if you are walking casually in the park, and you are not really exerting yourself too much and not raising your heart rate above a certain threshold, then you are not necessarily going to get cardiovascular benefits. So just bear that in, in, um, in mind. The next thing we will talk about with regards to um, exercise is, is in terms of muscle, muscle toning. Now, a lot of people do muscle toning in a lot of different ways, probably stretches, simple exercises. Some people do various forms of um, exercises for muscle toning. I think muscle toning is important and building muscle strength is important. And that point that you will see on the screen, maintenance of joint movement, what that really refers to is, as I've said, uh, one of the common presentations of lupus is with musculoskeletal or joint symptoms. And due to joint pain, joint swelling, joint stiffness, it is very common for patients to actually have reduced um, range, of, range of movements of joints because of um, usage and pain. So once you get to the stage where you're over the pain, it's important to get back into an exercise routine where you try to maintain your range of movement so you really don't lose function as such. Right, so the next thing we will talk a little bit about, and I'll try to address the question that was um, that was asked earlier on, is that of, uh... right, so I've seen the question on the screen about uh, lupus overlapping with um, rheumatoid arthritis. So that's a very interesting um, condition because you can actually have lupus um, and, and fulfill what we call classification criteria for lupus and do the same for rheumatoid arthritis. And if you do have that, then it is actually, the condition is referred to as um, rupus, just by way of information. But to answer the question, the advice wouldn't really be any um, uh, different. Um, in terms of all what I've said with regards to lifestyle and with regards to um, to exercise and diet and everything is more or less um, very much um, similar. Um, of course, 
people who have rheumatoid arthritis don't necessarily need to try to avoid sunlight and protect the skin like a lupus patient would, but almost everything else actually fits in. Okay, so we can move on to lupus and, and um, pregnancy. So one question I get asked many times is two things. One, if I will be, could become pregnant um, being a patient suffering with um, lupus, and um, is, 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 the, is pregnancy contraindicated? So, and I saw that question was also just asked, so I will answer that in one. So pregnancy is not necessarily contraindicated in, in patients with lupus, but pregnancy is certainly not recommended if a patient's lupus is not under um, control. So your disease should actually be under control for a minimum of about six months prior to um, uh, conception. So this would, of course, mean that you will have to be taking your medication. You would have to be uh, following up with your, your doctor. Your condition would have to be monitored. And if it, we are satisfied or your doctor is satisfied that the condition is under control for at least a six months period, then um, we could give the okay to go ahead. But before we give the okay to go ahead with pregnancy, some form of an assessment needs to be done. And there are two things which are important really. And one of that is we need to check the blood for something, some particular antibodies, which could have effect um, on the, the fetus or the newborn. And we also have to check the blood for what we refer to as clotting agents, which could actually have negative effects on the on the fetus or the um, during the um, the pregnancy. So blood tests must be must be done, and the blood test will have to be reviewed. And if there is the presence of, let us say, for example, clotting agents um, in the blood. Um, then a decision will have to be made as to whether the patient fulfills a criteria for something we call phospholipid syndrome, meaning that the patient has actually had clots before or had events before, or they don't have events. Depending on what is the um, situation, the recommendation for management during pregnancy will vary. And these pregnancies will have to be managed very closely with the uh, obstetrician and um, gynecologist because uh, medications will have to be um, introduced during the um, pregnancy if um, necessary. The other thing is, okay, so the next question that we saw is about uh, uh, how we could avoid painful rest periods or how to minimize interrupted rest periods. So that's actually a little bit of a tricky question because what you're probably referring to is actually control of the, the disease itself, if I'm actually interpreting the question correct. So to be honest with you, you will probably have to have, if you are having pain when you are actually um, going through restful periods, sleeping at night or even just sitting during the day, then what it is probably telling you is that the condition itself is actually not under control and that um, attention needs to be paid to, um, to the, the disease process itself, the medication that you are taking. Do you need more medication? Do you need optimization of the dose of medication? Do you need adjunctive medication to work with the medication you're on? You probably have to look at it like that. And of course, um, visit um, your lifestyle um, recommendations, which we talked about. Because one thing I like to stress is that when you're managing um, lupus, uh, medication is not the be all and end all. Dietary measures is not the be all and end all. And other lifestyle changes is not the be all and end all. They all work together. So it's not an either or situation. You have to look at all three. So I hope that answers the, um, the, uh, the question. Right, so the next question that comes up is the bottom of my feet feel like they are swollen, um, but they are not really, and they are worse with exercise. Now, the bottom of the feet could actually feel swollen in patients who have lupus for a very simple, straightforward reason, in that you could actually have inflammation affecting the joints of the toes. And uh, those joints are the joints that actually uh, connect the toe itself to the main part of the foot. 
And if those joints are uh, actively in inflamed, you will get the feeling or the sensation of um, the feet being swollen. It will be painful. If you step on it, it will hurt. In particular, when you get up from a sitting position and, or you get up from lying in bed and you wait beyond the feet, it would actually be weak. So that's one reason for it. And again, you will have to look at your disease um, itself, the, the state of the disease and what control needs to be um, um, brought into play. Now, the other thing, as we're on the point of feet, I would like to mention, which is a common thing that happens with a lot of people and it could cause a little bit of confusion, is that uh, um, sometimes you actually get pain in the feet, but in the sole of the feet itself. Um, and it's because of a condition called plantar fasciitis, which is extremely common. And it is actually worse if you get out of bed and step on the ground, if you, if you try to stand up from a sitting position. And plantar fasciitis probably has nothing to do with the disease process itself. It is a, is a separate entity on its, all on its own because it could actually happen in someone who doesn't even have lupus. And that will actually have to be managed um, separately. So I hope that answers the, um, the question. So coming back to pregnancy. Now, once we've done the assessment and we've given okay to, um, to go ahead with the pregnancy, then once the patient becomes pregnant, the patient should be seen um, in a gynecology clinic. And they will also, at least in our setting, they will be seen in the rheumatology um, clinic um, at least once monthly if possible because the, the disease has to be monitored, blood tests will be done, urine tests will be done to monitor the disease. Um, the, the gynecologists um, themselves will be doing um, uh, assessments on the, on the fetus, and there's a certain timing in the pregnancy um, when it becomes, sometimes it becomes um, necessary to um, actually begin monitoring the heart rate of the um, baby. So I'm just mentioning that not to cause any confusion, but just to let you all know that pregnancy should not be taken lightly because the pregnancy itself could actually cause a flame condition and sometimes the fetus could be affected and you need to really be aware of these very early on. Right, so moving on from pregnancy, the next thing, and I, I hope I answered the, um, the question that the person had earlier on when they were asking about why they are told that they should not become pregnant because just to reiterate it's not a matter of not becoming pregnant it is a matter of timing of pregnancy and if pregnancy is appropriate that is what it is a matter of so if you are someone who actually has um, uncontrolled disease if you are someone that has a certain amount of organ damage that is already existing say for example kidney involvement then in a case like that, pregnancy will become too risky and you might be advised against pregnancy. But if you're not in that scenario and your disease is well controlled, as I said earlier on, at least the six month period, then there should be no problem uh, with proceeding with the pregnancy once you do so in a very, very careful fashion. Okay, so back to lupus and children. So another question that I get asked very often is, uh, um, if um, if my child um, would actually have lupus uh, because I have lupus. Now, there is a genetic association with um, lupus. So the child of a, of a mother or a father who has lupus would actually be at a higher um, uh, risk of um, having um, uh, lupus. But I, I would like to stress that we not take that um, out of context because some people do get very concerned and they do get very worried and they start to wonder whether they should be doing blood tests at a regular interval and if they should be doing lupus tests on their children and all sorts of things. Then what I usually tell them is that what you need to do is you just need to monitor your child um, closely. There are certain things that you should not disregard. So if your child begins to complain of joint pain, a skin rash, fever that you don't have an explanation for, things like that, don't discard it. Take it seriously. Take the child to the pediatrician. Let the child be assessed. If the pediatrician or your GP believes that the child uh, is at risk and the child should be investigated, then the relevant investigations would be um, requested. So 
I, I hope that answers any um, doubt anyone might have about lupus and um, children. So the next thing I would like to say is a little bit about uh, lupus and COVID-19. So we couldn't uh, end the presentation without actually saying something about that. So the first thing I would like to say is that uh, um, all lupus patients are considered high-risk patients. So those patients are high risk for two reasons. One, because of the condition um, itself and because of the use of certain medications if they are on dose. So say, for example, people who are on um, uh, steroids, especially at doses of more than, let me say, 10 milligrams or more above, if they are on immunosuppressive um, drugs, um, those things actually put you at a higher risk also. But having said that, I don't think that uh, you really need to be um, over, overly um, concerned if you are actually doing well. There are lots of national and international guidelines. There are lots of things that you see on the news every day about uh, being careful, about wearing masks, about social distancing. Um, last night I was watching a, a documentary that talked in detail about not touching your face because uh, it is believed that one of the most common um, uh, ways that you actually get the disease is by touching an, infect, an infected surface and then touching your face in terms of your eyes or nose or mouth. So my advice to you is to just adhere to all the national and international recommendations very um, uh, strictly because you know that you are at um, um, higher risk. So we have a very interesting question about the role of uh, meditation. So I actually believe that meditation is, uh, could, could play um, a vital role in lupus and in the other autoimmune conditions and in lots of uh, medical conditions as a whole, not, not just autoimmune conditions, but in particular with uh, a, a lupus um, patients because meditation itself actually would have that uh, the benefit of um, uh, making someone um, more relaxed and in terms of stress it will significantly um, reduce your um, your your um, stress burden and I've spoken a few times in the presentation now about the negative effect of stress in either precipitating the disease or aggravating the disease. So I think that's a brilliant question. I think meditation is something that I should have included on my own. So I will thank uh, Swamiji very much for that um, question. The other thing I would like to say about um, the COVID is that you do not need a lot of patients ask this question do i need to stop taking medication i was actually called on the telephone on several occasions and asked should i stop taking medication what i would like to say is that there is no there are no guidelines that recommend the as we say in trinidad the wholesale stopping of medication because of the pandemic that we are going through uh, what is important is uh, that if you are if you are confirmed or probably highly suspected of having the infection the doctor who is treating you might actually um uh, withhold medication temporarily so i'll get back to that but let me answer the question about the plaquenil um it is true that during the covid 19 time that there was a problem with um, the hydroxychloroquine, which is the Plaquenil. Just to let people know generally, we, Plaquenil is the brand name drug that was originally, um, the hydroxychloroquine was originally marketed as. Um, sad to say we no longer have Plaquenil in the country. It is available in some places um, uh, internationally. Um, what we do have is hydroxychloroquine. In Trinidad right now, we have hydroxychloroquine in about three forms that I'm aware of. There is an English brand, there is a Canadian brand, there is a, um, a, a brand that comes out of um, India. So all of the medication did go into hiding during the time of the initial part of the COVID. But I would like to reassure people that at this point in time, there are many pharmacies who are beginning to get back the hydroxychloroquine 
um, and it could be um, so it could be sourced. Um, so that's good news um, for patients who attend the hospital. Um, the hospitals have always had hydroxychloroquine, so that was uh, even better news. But um, I'm sure that you could get it um, if you look around a little bit because it's back on the market. Okay, so let's go back to. Um, Okay, so the next question that comes up is um, in terms of experiencing pain and tingling in the toes and being unable to walk. So lupus is, the question that is asked towards the end is, is lupus linked with Raynaud's? And the answer is yes. So Raynaud's could actually be an integral part of lupus. Um, as, uh, to such an extent that um, don't be surprised if actually some patients present with Raynaud's as the initial presenting uh, symptom, which is not common, but it could occur, um, as well as it could occur during the course of the disease. Um, but the, if you have tingling in the feet, um, Raynaud's is usually associated with color changes in the feet. So your toes should usually be going blue or bluish in the cold if you have Raynaud's. So my advice to you, first of all, is that if you're not having color changes in the toes and you are having tingling and numbness in the toes, then the other possibility is that if you're having nerve involvement with the lupus, which can actually happen. For that, you will need to be seen by a neurologist. There are tests that you could do. Um, there's something called a nerve conduction study, which could be done, which could confirm the presence of per what we call peripheral nerve involvement. That's the nerves in the legs and the hands, etc. And then you could get treatment for that. So that needs to be diagnosed first and treated after. And if it's if the tingling or the funny feeling in the feet is because of um, Raynaud's, then Raynaud's could also be treated. Okay, so coming back to what we were saying, the your doctor might temporarily withhold some of your immunosuppressive drugs during treatment of COVID, and these will be restarted at the end. Hydroxychloroquine should not be stopped before, during, or after um, uh, infection with um, COVID. It is as straightforward as, as that. There's no problem with the drug. And the other drug that is of note is actually steroids. And it is not recommended for patients to stop their steroids abruptly. If they believe that they might have COVID infection or they are being treated for COVID because stopping steroids abruptly could actually have some seriously negative effects. So the use of steroids should be closely um, decided upon by the managing um, uh, doctor. So I think with that, um, we've come to the end of my prepared um, part of the speech. Um, I would like to thank Mr. Bagwin again. I would like to thank Dr. Sweet. I would like to thank all the listeners and I would invite any additional um, questions if there is any. And I'd like to thank all of those who have been sending their words of thanks to me. You are most welcome. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Diana. We will take some more questions now before we hand over to Dr. Sweet, our matron, our patron doctor. So are there any more questions that need to be answered? Simply, uh, write it on the YouTube and we will see it. I really appreciate all the comments that's coming. So we just hold a few seconds to see if there's any more questions. I think I get one more comment coming through. Let me see if I could send it across for us to look at. Okay, somebody named Nisha Parasan. She said a very excellent and clear presentation. Thank you, Dr. Dynan and the Lupus Society on Trinidad and Tobago. Well, we are here to help at any way or any way possible. Our sole purpose is for awareness and education. Right, and we have a battery of doctors who are always ready and stand by, just like Dr. Diana and Dr. Sweet, to assist us. And you know what, uh, friends, they, they do it for free. Yes, they do it for free, and that's very commendable. 
Very commendable. Okay. Dr. Sweet, I now hand, hand over to you. Thank you, Mr. Balgobin. And those who know me know that I'm very big on education and patient education and education even of medical uh, doctors and other health personnel. So thanks to Dr. Diane Ann for an excellent talk which covered so many aspects of lupus. I think that all of us learned a lot. Um, Mr. Balgobin, thank you so much for being so resourceful as to arrange this session for us, given the circumstances of COVID and our inability to meet in person. And thanks to all of the people who tuned in to this session. I hope they were able to learn a lot. And I look forward to the time when we can meet in person again. And I hope you all keep safe during this COVID pandemic. Thank you very much. Dr. Dynand, thank you for being our guest speaker and for sharing such informative information that I know the lupus patients, the friends and families who listen could really be, could really know what to do and how to approach the situation. A lot of, a lot of time, as you know, last two minutes, a lot of time, the lupus members always say, uh, you know, they wish the family could hear, they wish the family could hear ab about these things because they always know about it, the pain, the amount of medication. But I do hope that some family members were here listening and friends were listening online. And we in your home. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be in your presence, in your home. Thank you for the help by our dear patron doctor, Dr. Sweet. And I want to remind our lookers, our viewers, that uh, our telephone number is 7620038, 7620038. It's our WhatsApp number as well. Our email address is lupasocietytt at gmail.com, lupasocietytt at gmail.com. This has been a presentation of the Lupus Society of Trent Tobago in collaboration with Dr. Dynan and Dr. Sweet. Do have a wonderful evening and enjoy your, your Eid celebration, everyone.